Fighting Game Theater. Welcome, Warrior, to the Fighting Game Theater, where we analyze and break down the best intros, cutscenes, and mediocre cinematic adaptations of your favorite fighting game franchises. On this week's episode, we take a look at and review the first attempt at one such adaptation, which is Fatal Fury Legend of the Hungry Wolf. So strap on your gloves, tie your headband, and let's knuckle up! It is 1992, and Hayao Miyazaki, Hideaki Anno, and Sinichiro Watanabe are the premier hacks of the industry, which I'm sure is something we can all agree upon. One thing they all shared, aside from their mediocrity, is the fact that they could all learn a lot from directing, writing, and creating from the master of the form, Masami Obari. I, I can't go on with this charade any longer. Masami Obari was a solid C-plus player around this time, having cut his teeth on Bubblegum Crisis, and the brave fighter of Sun Firebird at the time. SNK, meanwhile, was looking to make crappy anime adaptations of their biggest fighting game franchises, and succeeded for the most part. Fatal Fury, however, was their biggest moneymaker, and thus entrusted their creation to the sticky hands of Obari for some reason. When presented with the offer, he just straight up refused and demanded that SNK give him a Neo Geo and a copy of Fatal Fury before he would sign on the dotted line. He played the game all week and, um, that's all she wrote. Thus, he got to work at adapting, citation needed, the story of the first game, with a limited budget and even less time, getting it straight to video in 1992, less than a year after the first Fatal Fury hit arcades in Japan. Our first visual starts off tray cinematique, a dramatic shot of a door opening, light cutting through a dark room, punctuated by a hearty, who's there? which is only followed up by silence until ninjas. Lots of ninjas. They proceed to kill the karate dudes via the power of the most stock sound effects ever. <laughs> They then grab a scroll that does something, and yeah, that's kind of it. Okay, let's go. Oof, so that was our establishing scene. So then we cut to... Sunny Southtown, a fictional Miami-like city in the United States. We see our two heroes, or at least one of them, young Terry and even younger Andy, accompanied by a side order of Master Roshi stand-in, Tung Fu Ru. Terry and Andy sound like this. What? Ugh. Anyway, their adopted father, Jeff Bogard, is getting hustled by horrible street urchins. The ringleader of this unruly mob, a uh, green hair, I guess, starts hawking her plastic flowers. See, she's here to distract Jeff, which is weird because he was already being distracted, but I guess a double distraction works twice as good. Enter some generic suited grunts. Jeff, thinking only of others, tells the kids to get away from here. And instead of, you know, getting away from here, they all latch onto him like mini lampreys, powering him up with a suit of child armor. Now, this would be great in theory because they could take a knife hit or two for Jeff, but they literally just anchor him down, making it harder to fight as the suits close in. Thanks, kids. But then, here comes the time to die, you fool guy. Time to die, you fool. Turns out he was yet another distraction because Jeff then gets cheap shotted in the back. Which he doesn't take too kindly to. <laughs> the juxtaposition of innocence and violence. <sighs> anyway, all of this is just a preamble to the debut of the young, pimp-ass future boss of Southtown, untitled geese game Howard, who is dead set on making Jeff dead. See, Jeff is a pretty good fighter even when he's being encumbered by children, so Mr. Howard thought it best to soften him up. The fight plays out like a lot of Obari's fights tend to do, incredibly quickly. A Repuken followed up by a punch is enough to take Jeff out, which signals Terry, Andy, and Roshi to finally arrive to see the thing they'll need to get revenge for later. Geese just casually leaves via his limo and then gets a call from his futuristic car phone and says, At last, I finally own the secret records of the Hakyoku Seiken school. Their techniques surpass every one of the Japanese martial arts. Now no one will be able to stop me. 
Let me explain. The ninjas we saw in the opening scene stole a scroll from the martial arts school that both Geese and Jeff trained at. Jeff was the favorite student of Master Roshi, so this was a double whammy heist orchestrated by Geese in the traditional Ocean's Eleven fashion. Get the goods while also simultaneously taking out your biggest rival who might have stopped you from getting the goods in the first place. Cut to the sniveling children who are already burying their dad. Now, I'm trying to immerse myself in the dramatic tone of this scene, but there's just an impossible amount of the ocean just glittering in the background whilst Mr. Tongue explains why they must always trust their fists and that the police will never help them. I'm certain that Geese has already bribed every one of them. Terry then asks why they can't just kill Geese right now, to which Tongue sighs and explains to child Terry that he is a child and it is far too dangerous. So instead, he instructs the pair to run away and live life on the streets for 10 years alone. Return here in 10 years, then you can avenge your father's murder. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, cue the title card. It is now 10 years later. Terry's all grown up and wearing the exact same clothes he had as a child because anime. Geese now basically owns the entire damn city because he's super rich due to the scrolls, I guess? Terry hits the local bar because I guess when you're on a revenge quest, that's the first logical stop. Billy Kane, this guy, thinks that Terry looks familiar. I've seen him before somewhere. The atmosphere changes suddenly in the club with the arrival of the local starlet, someone named Lily who is such a babe that I can't stand it. Oh man, she is such a babe. I can't stand it. Yeah. I just said that. She's doing some type of charity raffle, where the first person to catch a rose gets a night on the town with her. Thus, a Looney Tunes-esque brawl ensues. Terry takes out everyone, but in the fracas, one Joe Higashi is knocked for a loop. He then takes umbrage with Terry's wild brawl, and the two face off for not really a reason. Obari's directing here is just, oh, sublime. Just, just watch. He's got a nice defense. He's good. Before it can really get going, the fight is broken up by the arrival of the police. Thus, Joe and Terry make themselves scarce. They take a breather in an alley, and Joe suddenly decides to ask Terry if he'd like to come back to his hotel room and drink whiskey. I've got some whiskey back at my hotel. To which Terry is more than willing to oblige. Great. At the hotel, Joe reveals to Terry that over the years, he's conveniently sparred multiple times with Andy, while Terry reveals even harder that Andy should be showing up in Southtown tomorrow to enact their plan to kill Geese or whatever. Meanwhile, at Geese's Goose House, I knew I'd seen him somewhere before. Billy uses his expert detective skills to recall that Terry was the winner of Martial Arts Magazine, which seems of little concern to the big boss. Terry Bogard. Joe then passes out due to the fact that he can't handle his booze, and Terry tucks him in. Ah! A red cap wearing hero then decides to wander into random back alleys until he finds the oh what a babe from the club. While she gives fake chocolate coins to children, Terry just starts cutting a promo on her, giving her guff about being a rat in a cage or something. I know someone like them who's trapped like a bird in a gilded cage. She then promptly tells him to f off and to stop judging her. I'm finally seeing your true colors. Stop pretending you know me. Yeah, you go, girl. A horrible child then suddenly appears and hands Lily a lily. Little on the nose there, Abari, which then opens a psych lock in Terry's mind from 10 years ago. The green-haired girl that got his father killed grew up to be the green-haired woman that got his father killed. Geese tells one of his cronies, Hopper, to trail Terry. Follow him, Hopper. Which he promptly and subtly does. <whistles> Terry goes off to visit Jeff's grave before suddenly... Yeah! The two brothers have a very quick exchange before Master Roshi stops them mid-punch in a shot that's classic Obari. 
Anyway, let, let's just talk about the elephant in the room here. Why the hell is Andy's hair silver? In no game, even Fatal Fury 1 or Fatal Fury Wild Ambition, was it ever silver? This seems like a creative choice of Obari's, but it just seems so random. Did, did they think audiences wouldn't be able to tell the two brothers apart because they were both blondes? <sighs> Regardless, they realized how dumb it was and corrected it in later Fatal Fury productions, thank God. Tongue reveals that there's a super secret ultimate bloodline technique that was never written down and that Geese has no idea it exists since the scroll he nabbed excluded it. Tongue proposes that he'll teach said ultimate attack move to the superior brother and armed with this knowledge, they'll be strong enough to defeat Geese. Andy's VO here is just, oh, it's phenomenal. So then why did you choose to teach our father instead? Oh, Terry, let's fight now. All right, then Geese is sure to be there, isn't he? While this is happening, Ripper and Hopper are overhearing all of it, and they're literally two feet away and act incredibly inconspicuous once Terry kind of notices them. Come on guys, this is Surveillance 101. Anyway, it then seems like Tung knew they were spying and that they work for Geese, but blabbed about their entire plan anyway, which is, that that's just terrible. Those two where geese is men. Terry then says that the best way for them to settle things is to simply hash it out at the King of Fighters tournament, which Andy is just tickled pink over. This is great. Ripper and Hopper inform Geese about this secret technique, news which Geese takes, um, rather poorly. What? Cue the fighting montage. Hey, hey, let's go, King Kasuru. Terry is set to have his first match, but to make sure that doesn't even happen, Guy sends Lillian with a little bit of the bubbly that has an especially deadly aftertaste. Lily suggests that they have a pre-victory celebration, and Terry agrees, asserting that being inebriated before a martial arts competition would be a fabulous idea. Why not? That'll get my blood flowing. Lily immediately starts trembling uncontrollably, which clues Terry into the fact that there might be something amiss. Regardless, he decides to drink the incredibly poisoned beverage as a test to see if Lily would even stop him. That that that's our hero there. Anyway, she thankfully does. Lily then tearfully asks for forgiveness, to which Terry reciprocates, and implied makeouts are then implied. Mr. Bogart, it's time for your fight. Uh, all right, I'm coming. After that awkward pause, Terry suddenly turns and says, I won't give up until I freed you from your cage, Lily. Terry. What is that? What the fuck is that? Our hero's first opponent is Richard Meyer, who looks nothing like Richard Meyer. This fight is just hard to remember because it's over so quickly, but then Joe exclaims, It's the rising tackle. No, it's goddamn not. All right, Exhibit A, Rising Tackle, or Rising Tackle, as it's known more commonly. Exhibit B, whatever the hell this is. Ah, oh, Jesus, Obari, this stuff is already mapped out in the games for you. You can just copy it. It's not that difficult. Cue another montage. Terry and Andy then face off for their match of destiny. Since Lily failed her poisonation mission, Geese decides to step it up with a sniper who I guess will kill them both or, or just ter Terry, it's unclear. Joe uses his Joe sense to detect a faint glimmer of light from the rifle scope behind him and thrusts his body into the ring to take the hit. The sniper is then of course flustered and starts to gear up for another shot when suddenly, Cut to our heroes running down a corridor. Seems like Lily might have tripped the breakers, I assume, because it's never really explained, whatever. The crew head for the roof of the building where surely nothing bad will happen. Geese somehow catches wind of all of this and confronts Lily in a frank and civilized manner. You owe me your life for rescuing you from the slums ungrateful bitch. They work through their differences and Geese is sentimental enough to let Lily escape and even shows her a faster way to exit the building. Terry goes to check on her. Are you okay? Our hero then swears 
like double revenge on Geese, as I suppose the death of the only father he's ever known wasn't enough pro-tag fuel to get through the rest of this running time. Master Tongue then arrives in the Tongue Mobile, and the wolf pack runs off to lick their wounds. But not before Spry Billy Kane tags the old man with his cudgel. It's now the very next scene, and we are suddenly in a hospital, with Tongue on his deathbed reeling from Billy's attack. Andy storms off in a fit, because he's Andy, wanting to get triple revenge on Geese, and Terry goes after him. Tongue pleads for him to stay, so he can teach him the forbidden technique. Take me outside now. Terry agrees, because deep down, he probably doesn't give a crap about what Andy's doing anyway. The two, not having nearly enough money to pay for American healthcare, escape from the hospital and into a nearby forest for a quick training exercise. Alright, Senpuken is what's on the blackboard today, children. Please turn your books to page 25. Tongue breaks down the core principles of the move. You absorb the key from the earth into your body through your legs, and then release it at your enemies. Concentrate all of your attention on your legs and feel the key of the earth. But Terry's unable to do it, so Tongue decides to apply more visual and physical aids. Terry is thankful for the lesson, but notices Tongue is now in some type of vegetative state, or he's a statue, whatever, he's dead. Terry then settles the old age debate once and for all. Dubs versus subs. Thank you, master, I'll never forget! Dubs. Cut to Joe and Andy storming Geese's compound. First, they have to face a bunch of jobbers, in addition to both Billy and Raiden. Fighting ensues. A crony then runs up to Geese to warn him of the party crashers, but Geese is nonplussed. Billy and Raiden can handle them. No, they can't. After playing possum to boost the bad guy's confidence, both Joe and Andy easily dispatch of the two mid-bosses, where we are then treated to the climactic showdown of Geese Howard versus Andy Bogard. I suppose I'll have to dispose of you myself as a memento to Jeff Bogard. You're going down, man! <laughs> It goes about as well as you'd expect. One thing about anime adaptations of fighting games is that a simple special move that takes off like 15% of your opponent's life has the power of an atomic blast in the anime. Terry arrives just in time to see just how much of a loser Andy really is. Geese is amused by this. So both brothers have come seeking death. That makes both of you fools. Geese. I'll never forgive you! Mr. Howard then suddenly starts doing instant transmissions, despite not having any powers close to that in the games, and makes fighting Terry seem like child's play. Our hero then realizes... None of my techniques work. <coughs> He knows every move. The Senpuken technique is then unleashed, but Terry kinda sucks at it. He decides to self-motivate by uttering... Come on, Terry. Absorb the force of Mother Earth into your body! and thinks about all the force ghosts of his dead loved ones. Which, in the later animes, is a thing that actually happens. Terry decides at the last minute to add a flourish of creativity and turns the technique into a spinning kick maneuver for some reason. Geese falls into his little moat and is assuredly dead, consumed by the koi fish he loves so dearly. <laughs> Similar to many of our formative years playing video games, Andy thanks his big brother for beating this super hard boss and getting the best ending. Terry then looks to the sky and says with a gleam in his eye, It's a brand new day. And we fade to black. Now, what happened to our heroes, you ask? Well... So, what did I think of Fatal Fury, The Legend of the Hungry Wolf? Well, it certainly exists. It's 45 minutes long, I can say that for certain. Also say that it certainly never drags. Its brevity is its strength. Terry and co are, you know, a respectable cookie cutter group of heroes. You want to see them succeed and defeat the despicable Geese Howard. And you know, when you're talking about fighting anime, that's what you should do. And it succeeds at that. In terms of negatives, well, the fighting choreography is barely there, almost non-existent. It's hard to call these fights fights, they're more like scuffles. But that might be more of an indicator of the budget and time frame rather than the quality of the production itself. It doesn't look especially good, some sequences look distinctly low quality, and it never gets truly exciting, but in terms of one of the earliest fighting game adaptations, 
It's not bad. The follow-up, Fatal Fury 2, The New Battle, is an improved sequel across the board, the fighting scenes included, and has Terry going up against the beefy beefcake known as Wolfgang Krauser. All of this would culminate in Fatal Fury, the motion picture, which is essentially giving Obari carte blanche to do whatever the hell he wanted. That is including a bunch of his stupid OCs and ancient world MacGuffins. You can snag Fatal Fury, Legend of the Hungry Wolf, and the new battle in a combo pack put out by Discotech with some cool Neo Geo inspired artwork. You know, it might be on YouTube or whatever, but as always, support the official release. So that about sums up the fight. If you know of any other intros, cutscenes, or bad animes you'd like to nominate to step into the ring, give a shout out in the comments below. I'm Matt Muscles, and I'll see you next time in the Fighting Game Theater.